Good evening and welcome. We'll be starting at 6.05. We'll be starting in just a few minutes at 6.05. If you're just joining us, we will be starting in a couple minutes. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us for tonight's webinar. We'll be talking about turf grass, turf grass alternatives. So if you're considering taking out your lawn, this is the talk for you. The coordinator for the Master Gardeners tonight is Gail Burt, and I'll hand it over to her now. Hi, Gail. Hi, Serenity. Thank you very much. 
And welcome everybody. As Serenity said, we have a, a wonderful talk on turf grass alternatives. And I am uh, a UC Master Gardener volunteer and tonight's moderator. Uh, this program is co-sponsored uh, by the Contra Costa County Library and the University of California Master Gardeners. Uh, if you have any questions tonight, uh, we love questions. We would like to, I'd like to direct your um, attention to the Q&A icon down at the bottom of your screen. Please use that uh, to enter any questions that you may have. Um, we are not monitoring questions through the chat. So just please use the Q&A. Uh, we have two expert master gardeners joining us to help with answering questions. So thank you to Diane and Stephanie for supporting us this evening. Uh, the other thing we're going to have a live Q&A with the speaker at the end of the um, talk tonight. So we will, uh, any of the questions that hadn't been answered, we will be answering some of them live. Um, we do ask if you have some questions, please maybe hold for a few moments until the speaker has a chance to go through some of the material as some of those questions may be answered. Um, otherwise, we, we certainly welcome them and we will get to as many as we possibly can. So our mission is to extend research-based knowledge and information on home horticulture, pest management, and sustainable landscaping practices to the residents of Contra Costa County. So we welcome you and we hope you enjoy the conversation tonight. Tonight, our speaker is Henry Shaw. Henry is a graduate of the 2022 University of California Master Gardener class. He has loved growing plants since he was a small child. He has a community garden plot and has extensive container garden for vegetables and in-ground fruit trees at his home in San Ramon. Henry retired in late 2019 from a 35 year career at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. His formal academic training was in geology and chemistry. And for the past 10 years at Livermore, he was the chief scientist for the roughly 1,000 person physical and life sciences organization there. Prior to that, he worked on diverse collection of projects, including nuclear waste disposal, environmental biology, microbiology, and the role of soil microbiome in carbon sequestration. These days, in his spare time, Henry volunteers at the Exploratorium, is the current president of the Diablo Orchid Society, and with his wife, Marina, is an avid forager of edible mushrooms and seaweeds. So I'm gonna turn the presentation now over to you, Henry. Thank you, Gail. And welcome everybody uh, on this beautiful late summer, uh, early fall, this fall is in the air today, uh, evening. Uh, and we'll, as Gail said, for the next hour or so, we're gonna talk about turf grass alternatives uh, for our area. And there are several things I wanna, that I hope you'll get out of this talk. So after the, seeing this presentation, uh, you'll understand what we mean by turf grass, You'll understand the origin and history of lawns. Why do we have lawns? You'll understand that uh, cool season turf grasses need a lot of water in our dry summers here if you want them to stay green. You'll understand that there are viable alternatives to what we normally use for our lawns. And I'll give you resources uh, to learn more about them. And you'll have a sense of the strengths and weaknesses of some of the uh, various alternatives to turf grass lawns. But before I go further, I want to get a sense of the audience that I have tonight. Uh, so there's a poll coming up, and basically it's asking you, are you thinking about replacing your lawn, or maybe you have already? It, the poll has two questions. Uh, the first asks, 
are you considering replacing your lawn? The second one is really only to be answered by the people who have done something with their lawn already. And it asks what you've done about replacing your lawn. So go ahead and answer those. We'll give it a few minutes. Forty percent participation. Two thirds of you have answered. Yes. Answers are still coming in. about 80 percent participation serenity did you show the uh, results to people i'm going to share the results and it looks like about uh, almost 40 percent of you have already done something with your lawns and uh, another over 50 percent of you are considering something only two percent absolutely love their lawn uh, and won't get rid of it that's interesting. Uh, and of the people who have done something with their lawns, uh, it looks like the dominant alternative has been to replace it with shrubs and other plants uh, so that the space is no longer a flat green area. Uh, but a good number of you, about 15%, uh, replaced it with the turf grass alternative, such as a ground cover. And a good portion of you are still trying to figure out what to do. So I'm gonna stop sharing. There you go. So, so what is turf grass? So if you look it up, in the, in the look up a definition for turf grass, turf grasses are narrow leaved grass species that form a uniform, low lying, low, long lived uh, ground cover that can tolerate foot traffic and low mowing heights. It is, um, you know, what do we think about when we think about a lawn? It's something you can walk on in your bare feet. It's green all year. We cut it to you know heights that are that doesn't come up above your ankles. It's not up to your knees. Uh, it's not mounding. It's pretty flat. And I'll give you the bottom line up front. There is no alternative that has all those attributes of cool season turf grasses that, that we think about when we think about a lawn. Unfortunately. We talk a little bit more about grasses. The grass family is huge. It's a large and diverse uh, family of plants. It's the fifth largest family of plants with over 12,000 different species. Uh, it covers anywhere between, depending on how you define it, you know, a grassland. Grasslands cover 30 to 50 percent of the surface, the land surface of the earth. They're probably the most cosmopolitan family of, of plants. Uh, grasslands occur on every continent except for Antarctica. Uh, and I have to tell a story. One of my friends, who's an ex-professor at the UC San Francisco, uh, retired recently and went down to Antarctica on a bird watching tour. And he was, you know, walking around the beach, this gravel beach, uh, and noticed a bunch of his colleagues, and, you know, co-tourists were, were all clustered around something, staring at it. And it turned out it was a sprig of grass. So there is actually there is grass in Antarctica. There just aren't grasslands. Uh, but they are present on pretty much every continent. This, this figure here is the family tree, the evolutionary family tree of grasses. Grasses have been on Earth for about over 65 million years. We know that from people who study dinosaur poop. Dinosaur poop has things in it called uh, phytoliths, which are little silica hard mineral parts that, that occur in grasses. Uh, and the shape of those things are characteristic. People have found, scientists have found uh, phytoliths that are very similar to the phytoliths that occur in modern rice. There are two sort of subfamilies. There's things that are grow in warm seasons, which are these down here, and things that grow in, in cooler climates. And grasses are very diverse, everything from reeds to sugarcane to switchgrass to corn, 
the things we think about uh, often as, as typical grasses like fescues and rye, bluegrass, and a lot of our grains, wheat, barley, oats, and other cereals. And then there are the warm season grasses uh, that we also use for lawns, things like Bermuda grass, buffalo grass, soysia, as, as well as edible grains like millet and teff, and things like bamboo and rice. These are all grasses. It's a very diverse family of, uh, of plants. The two that we're gonna concentrate on tonight are the cool season grasses that we use for lawns, fescues, rye, bluegrass, and warm season grasses uh, like Bermuda grass and uh, buffalo grasses. So what's the difference between why the, these two types of grasses, cool season and warm season grasses? Well, cool season grasses stay green all year. If you water them, they get enough water all year. If you water them in the summer around here, they grow best between temperatures about 60 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. They're not so, uh, they don't particularly like the heat, you know, the heat of our summers. They have poor to fair heat tolerance. They slow down, their growth slows down when it's uh, very hot in the summer and they will go dormant unless you water them. Some examples are, are fescues, tall and fine fescues uh, that you commonly see in grass seeds around here. Kentucky bluegrass, very water hungry grass, perennial rye grasses and bent grasses. In contrast, warm season grasses, as the name implies, flourish in the summer, they go dormant in the winter when the temperatures get below about 50 degrees. They like it above 75 degrees Fahrenheit, so they're heat tolerant. They're also relatively drought tolerant and they're, they're pretty tough, they withstand heavy use. Uh, examples of warm season grasses are Bermuda grass, St. Augustine grass, zoysia, and buffalo grass. In our area, most of the lawns are composed of cool season turf grasses. This is a little map of, of the United States, as you might expect. The warm season grasses are, are adapted best to our, you know, our the warmer parts of the country, the subtropical parts of the country. Uh, and in between the cool season and the, the warm season zones, there's a transition zone where you find both types of grasses. The turf grass actually occupies over 2% of the land in the, in the US. That's three times more than any other irrigated crop. It's over 50 million acres. But turf grass lawns are expensive. We spent over $100 billion on lawn care in the US uh, in 2020. That's twice the total US foreign aid budget for uh, 2021. That's before we started sending money to uh, Ukraine. They're time consuming. Typical US homeowner uh, spends 75 to 150 hours maintaining the lawn every year. But uh, you know, compare that, most of us only get 80 hours of paid time off work. So it's... And they're actually relatively hazardous. 80,000 Americans are injured every year using lawnmowers. That's comparable to the number of annual firearms in injuries. 10,000 of those injuries involve children. 30% 30, uh, 30 result in amputation. Hang on a second. Turn off the call I was coming in. Sorry. So, so why in the world do we do this? Why do we have, why do we spend this money, spend this time and risk our, our, our fingers? Well, to answer that question, you have to go back a thousand years to the Middle Ages when feudal landowners in Northern Europe cleared the forests around their forts and castles. And, and this is primarily for defense. So the people couldn't hide in the woods and sneak up on the castle and shoot arrows or you know, batter down the, the front gates. They cleared them so you had a, a, a defensible space around, uh, around the castles. The word law, uh, lawn actually comes from archaic English word book called a lond, which is an open space in the woods, like a glade or a pasture. So these cleared spaces around the, the castles were, were initially used to graze livestock. Uh, they kept the, the, the grasses and the other herbs, that, the herbaceous plants that grew there uh, down and mowed down. But uh, these, these spaces transitioned to recreational use, things like quits and horseshoes and lawn billiards, which evolved into croquet, lawn bowling, uh, picnicking, and uh, it wasn't very pleasant to, to do that if there was a lot of animal poop uh, in, in the lawns. Uh, so maintaining these areas switched over to actually using human labor, some men with sides, uh, which took a huge workforce. Because of that, it actually became a sign of the wealth and power of the landowner. 
by the 17th century, these vast green spaces uh, were, were incorporated into palatial landscapes. And there were ostent ostentatious displays of, of the wealth and status of, of the owners of these, these palaces. Um, you know, by the, uh, you know, the, the archetypal uh, uh, example are the tapis vert around the Palace of Versailles, the green carpets around the Palace of Versailles. By the 18th century, prominent uh, and wealthy Americans had started to emulate the Europeans. People like Thomas Jefferson and George Washington had landscapes at Monticello and Mount Vernon designed to look like those of English uh, country estates with, with uh, broad you know, uh, carpets of lawn uh, around their, uh, their buildings. More, uh, more generally, the concept of green spaces was imported to Europe in the 19th century by landscape architects, notably Frederick Wall Olmsted, who designed uh, many parks, dozens of parks around the United States, uh, including Central Park in, in uh, New York and Washington Park in Chicago, as well as uh, states of the wealthy. He also designed one of America's first planned suburban developments outside of Chicago, this is Riverside, in 1868. Uh, Riverside was uh, unique and unusual in that the, the, the houses were set back 30 feet from the street. And unlike homes in, in England, um, the, the, which are often separated by walls, there were no walls. So the, the Riverside had this carpet of green with houses set among it. So giving the uh, impression that you're living in a park so that you don't have to be uh, a millionaire or a billionaire to live in a park. Also around this time, things that helped develop the, uh, the adoption of lawns was the availability of mechanical lawnmowers at the end of the 19th century. By the early 20th century, uh, the commercial lawn industry had actually developed with uh, you know, commercial seeds, fertilizers, and guides on how to, how to uh, take care of your lawn. And around that time in the United States, golf became a popular recreational activity. So again, in, in large areas of green open space. In the post-war era, post-World War II era, people uh, you know, had more general availability of cars and that led to a suburban sprawl so as people moved from the cities to, to, the, to the suburbs. Lawns became a fixture in the US landscape. Um, just as in Riverside, the suburban track homes were set back from the roads, not fronting right on the roads, typically didn't have walls separating them. Uh, and, and uh, gave the impression that you too can live in a home surrounded by a flat green space, like a park, just like the wealthy people do. Uh, the archetypal and archetypal uh, suburban development was Levittown in the late 50s. The houses came with instructions on how to maintain your lawn and you had to maintain your lawn. And around this time, motorized lawnmowers were developed and that made maintenance easier. So that's fine if you live on the East Coast or in Northern Europe where it rains all the time, but it's not so great for our area in our Mediterranean climate where we have a dry summer. So what I plotted here are the water needs versus the actual precipitation for two places, London, England, and Concord, California. So the water needs expressed in terms of inches of precipitation are the blue bars as a function of time, these are the months of the year along the bottom. And what the, the plants need, what, what a turf grass needs, a cool season turf grass needs in terms of irrigation, in terms of inches of water, are shown in the green bars. So obviously, you know, the, the water needs go up in the, uh, in the summer, when it's actively growing, and it's less in the winter. Uh, here in London, you can see that, you know, it rains all year. If you've ever been to London, you know, it's a rainy place. Uh, and... By and large, you know, the, the cumulative deficit in terms of if I add up all the water that the grass needs and compare that uh, with how much precipitation the grass sees, uh, there's only a couple of about two inches of, of deficit, which is within the noise, really. Uh, a little bit of irrigation in London is enough to give you a, a very healthy lawn. But compare that with Concord, where two things to note is one is it doesn't rain in the summer, as most of us uh, know, and two, the grasses here actually need more water. Grasses here need, you know, six inches of water, peaking at six inches of water in a month. Whereas in London, they need much less. That's because it's hotter and more, uh, and more arid here. Plants uh, evapotranspire more here. 
But just at the peak of, of their water needs, we don't get any rain in July and August. So by the end of the year, the water year, uh, there's a cumulative irrigation deficit of about 30 inches of water. Um, just for you know, interesting fact, the average total rainfall in Concord in the year is about 17 inches. So what does this mean? So for my fairly modest backyard, which is a 1,350 square feet, if you do the calculations, that needs almost 25,000 gallons of water uh, for the summer months if I irrigate from April to October. That's just not, these grasses are not native to here. They're not adapted to here. You can keep them green, but you are gonna pay for it. If you go to visit Italy, or Greece or Spain or other Mediterranean uh, countries, you don't see lawns. Lawns are not common. They are not part of the, uh, the landscape aesthetic there. But you know there are benefits to having lawns and lawn-like spaces, these flat green areas. Obviously they provide a nice soft space for, for uh, kids and, and adults to play games, uh, play with your pets, to play sports on. You want to roll around on something, lawns are a nice thing to roll around on. Green is known to be a psychologically soothing color, you know, but it's it's calming. Uh, it, it reminds us of nature and being able to see that outside your house is, is a nice thing. Uh, lawns reduce uh, runoff. They reduce the urban heat effect. They, they cover the soil. They, they uh, sustain the soil's biological community, which is important. And some of us have to comply with homeowners association requirements. Uh, they may require you to have things that look like lawns or lawn-like spaces. Although most homeowners associations these days are a little, uh, given the drought situations we've had, uh, are a little uh, more lenient these days. One thing people think of if they wanna replace their water thirsty lawn are, is hardscaping and artificial turf. The problem with these are is they can get extremely hot. Hardscaping like concrete or stones uh, and artificial turf are typically 30 to 60 degrees hotter than the air. You can burn yourself. There are numerous studies. I tried to look at what the highest temperature was, and the highest temperature I could find was a, uh, a published study in Provo, Utah, that the, uh, the turf grass, not turf grass, the artificial turf reached a temperature of 200 degrees Fahrenheit on a 98 degree day. 200 degrees Fahrenheit is almost enough to avoid water. Uh, and it's certainly enough to give you burns, severe burns if you walked on it. Um, I know that are, you know, there, are, there are schools that have installed artificial turf in, a, in an attempt to save water, but they found that they actually have to water them to keep them cool enough to, to play on. Uh, and you have to water them a lot. If you water them just a little for 20 minutes, and then it'll get the temperature down, but uh, within another 20 minutes, it's back up uh, to, to uh, burning, burning temperatures. Uh, artificial turf is expensive to install. Artificial turf is a petroleum-based product, so that has environmental impacts. They're actually not weed-free over time. Dust and dirt blows in, and you can actually get things uh, germinating in the, in the artificial turf. They don't support the soil's biological community. In fact, they kill it. They, they heat the, uh, the subsur subsurface soil. Uh, and you can actually damage adjacent plants if you put your artificial turf too close uh, to things like shrubbery and trees. You'll, you'll heat, the, uh, heat up the soil uh, and impede water infiltration into the soil. And eventually they wear out and they're gonna end up in a landfill. So we are not... Uh, enthusiasts for artificial turf. So as I said at the beginning, there is no perfect alternative uh, that duplicates, replicates all of the attributes, the desirable attributes of a, a cool season turf grass lawn. Uh, but there are many, so there's gonna be trade-offs and there's many things that you can trade off and what's important to you uh, will determine what sort of alternative you end up with. So drought is obviously one thing. How much how much water does a uh, does the alternative use? But other things are: can you walk on it? Can you walk on it in your bare feet? Or do you have to wear sneakers? Is it pet friendly? Is it invasive? Uh, does it ma match your environmental conditions? Do you have a shady lawn or a sunny lawn? How much maintenance do you want to 
perform on it. Do you want to mow it every week or do you not want to mow it every, you know, more than once or twice a summer, growing season? Uh, how much do you have to spend on fertilizer to keep it green and, and good looking? Uh, how, how long lived is it? Uh, you have to sustain it, re replant it uh, at intervals. So there's many potential factors you have to consider uh, when selecting an alternative to a turf grass. And there are many potential turf grass alternatives. How do we how do we judge these? Th these are uh, things that are in the handout that we'll have access to at the end, and I'll go uh, talk about them in more de detail in a few moments. But so to, to winnow this down, I've used six criteria, which are admittedly somewhat subjective, but they're sort of the things that we think of uh, when we think about a lawn, and that is, can you walk on it? What, how tolerant is it to foot traffic? Can you play on it? How much water does it require? That's obviously important these days in California. Uh, what's its environmental tolerance? And by that, this is sort of a catch-all. That means, you know, is it is it frost tender? Uh, is it heat resistant? Is it resistant to diseases or is it prone to getting diseases like a fungal infection? Uh, is it tolerant of shade? How much light does it need? Things like that. Uh, does it need perfect soil or does it grow in our clay soils that we commonly have here in Contra Costa? Um, how does it look year round? Uh, is it green all year? Is it, does it go dormant in the winter? Does it go yellow in the winter? Does it patchy bald spots in the winter? And does it burn out in the summer? Um, how much does, uh, how, you know, what, are, what are its maintenance requirements? How much mowing, fertilization, replacement is, uh, is required? And another catch-all, is it environmentally friendly? Is it a California native? Does it attract pollinators? Uh, does it fix nitrogen in the soil? And so on, things like this. So I've assessed all of the, uh, those, those many alternatives across the top, listed across the top, with the first column being cool season turf grasses uh, for comparison. And then given a, a, a grade, stoplight chart grade. If it's green, then it means it's pretty good. If it's yellow, it means uh, maybe. And if it's red, that means you know, it's kind of deficient in that area. Uh, so for instance, a cool season turf grass takes foot traffic, but it needs a lot of water, so it's red. It needs a lot of maintenance, so it's red. It looks good year round if you, if you give it enough water. It's reasonably intolerant tolerant of uh, various environmental conditions. It's not invasive, but it's not it's not native to, to California. It's not pollinator friendly. So I've done that for all of these uh, alternatives. And tonight I will not have time to talk about all of these things, uh, but I'm gonna talk about the ones that are highlighted in, in blue. So it's about uh, five or six of these. And the first alternative I'll talk about is UC Verde buffalo grass. This is a... Uh, a, a, a hybrid grass that's been developed by UC Davis and UC Riverside specifically for the climate here in California and Arizona. It's developed from a native prairie grass, a buffalo grass, but it has a finer texture and it stays green longer throughout the year, a year uh, than the native buffalo grass, the wild type buffalo grass does. Uh, it's nearly seedless, so it doesn't produce much pollen, so it's good for people with allergies. Its main drawback is it yellows in the winter. It is a it is a warm season grass that goes dormant in the winter. And you can see here, uh, this is a building at UC Davis. Um, in the summer, nice green lawn. In the winter, it goes this golden color. Its water needs are about twenty five percent of that of a traditional lawn, so it's pretty pretty water efficient. UC Davis has also done studies of, of uh, looking at how much water, how much, how little water can you put on it to still get a, 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 a good looking turf. Uh, and the link to those studies is actually in the handout that, that you'll get at the end of the talk. It grows in full sun to partial shade. It won't grow in full, full shade. It grows rather slowly, so you don't have to mow it very often. If you don't mow, it'll grow about six inches high, but if you want it to look like a, a normal lawn, uh, you can mow it once or twice a month, every two to three weeks probably, um, for a more traditional lawn look. You can use it just like a traditional lawn. It tolerates medium to heavy foot traffic. Uh, but as I said, it goes winter dormant. It goes, it goes brown in December and starts to green up uh, in, in 
late February or early March. You would install this uh, if you want to replace your lawns uh, in plugs. These are little things you put in as as a hole, plant them in little holes on about a nine or twelve inch spacing, uh, and it takes about three months to establish. And you want to do that in the summer or late spring because it is a warm season turf grass, so it's most uh, most active in the summer. It's widely available uh, now, even though it's a fairly relatively new plant. Another alternative is Karapia. It was developed in Japan. It's actually a patented plant. It's developed in, by, by researchers in Japan uh, for growing in drought conditions. It's quite tolerant of different soils and, over, and ranges of temperatures. It grows quite quickly to establish a dense ground cover, uh, but it's sterile, so it doesn't reseed itself. You don't get unwanted seeding uh, elsewhere in your garden. Does, it's not invasive. It has pink or white blossoms, uh, which attract bees, which could be a good thing if you want to attract pollinators, but perhaps not such a good thing if you want to walk around on your bare feet. Uh, you can, it, uh, it is also a fairly low, low water use plant, uh, about 25 to 50% of the water needs of a traditional lawn. It needs full sun, uh, and it'll grow to one to three inches tall if you don't mow it. But you can mow it uh, once or twice a month to reduce the number of flowers, and that will reduce the number of bees. Uh, it is not like a, a regular turf grass. It'll only tolerate light to medium foot traffic. Uh, and uh, again, if the flowers are mowed, you, you won't have the bee problem. It is uh, sensitive to temperature. It's frost sensitive. It goes semi-dormant. It develops patchy brown areas in the winter if the temperatures go below 45 degrees C. And the surface grass, the surface expression, the, the leaves will die back at temperatures below about 38 Fahrenheit. But it will regrow again in the spring from the roots. It doesn't kill the roots uh, at those temperatures. Uh, again, it's a, a warm season plant, so you want to install it in, uh, you know, in the spring to late early fall. And it's available either as sod or as plugs. And it, again, it takes three to four months to, uh, to establish itself. Another alternative is white clover, specifically micro clover. Um, micro clover, unlike ordinary white clover, which white clover will get about eight inches high, uh, micro clover grows much lower and it doesn't flower as much. So therefore it doesn't attract as many bees. Uh, a great aspect of clover is that it fixes nitrogen. Nitrogen is one of the essential plant nutrients uh, that we typically have to add to our lawns in the form of fertilizer. It produces its own uh, uh, bioavailable nitrate by using bacteria on its roots. It competes with most weeds and it uh, tends to discourage other, other uh, pest, uh, pest plants. It's good between stepping stones or as a fill-in, or you can use it in a mixed crop, mix it with your grasses. This is something my father tried to eradicate from his lawn uh, when I was a kid. For, you know, he would pull his hair out when he saw clover, but in fact, clover is a, a good alternative to, to the grasses that he was growing back east. It tolerates compacted soils. Uh, it tolerates uh, pet urine. It doesn't yellow in uh, response to pet urine, but it, it can be somewhat invasive. Microclover, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about. Um, Microclover doesn't grow as high. It tolerates sun, to partial shade. Uh, it does need water, but about half as much as a traditional lawn. Uh, micro clover will grow about six inches tall as opposed to eight inches for regular clover. Uh, and you can mow it once or twice a month to reduce the number of flowers and encourage a denser uh, growth. However, it's pretty heavy foot traffic uh, uh, if you mow it to get rid of the flowers. It goes winter dormant. And some of the cultivars, some varieties are frost sensitive, but around here, I don't think that's going to be a problem. We don't get the hard frost that they get uh, in the you know, more northern parts of the, the U.S. Uh, installing it in the spring or fall is best, and you plant from seed. It takes uh, about a month, plus or minus a couple of weeks, for it to establish. Uh, drawback is micro clover seed is, is less readily available and it's more expensive than regular clover, and, uh, but it is available. Another nice alternative that I just saw in my neighborhood yesterday walking around 
is silver carpet, also called brocadidi. Uh, it grows in full sun to part shade, but it needs only about 25% of the, the water of a traditional lawn. It tolerates light to medium foot traffic. Uh, it tends to do better in coastal areas, but I'm here in San Ramon and one of my neighbors has this uh, and it's doing fine. And we get up to over hundred degrees in the summer, uh, two, you know, days at a time. It is frost sensitive. It, it will uh, die back uh, at temperatures below 28, which is pretty cold for, for our area. Uh, a drawback is it needs to have very good, good drain, so, good drainage in the soil. Uh, otherwise it's subject to fungal issues uh, in, in poorly drained clay soils. You can install it year round, it's sold in flats, uh, in nurseries, it's widely available. Uh, you don't need to mow it. And it has these nice little yellow daisy-like flowers in the summer. Uh, if you want to get rid of the flowers, you can mow those off. And it, it produces a, this lovely uh, silvery green carpet. Hence the name silver carpet. Another alternative are native fescues. Fescues, of course, are grass. The specific ones that are native to California. Uh, they don't tolerate shade too much. They want full suns, about 50% shade. Depending on the variety of the species that you get, they could have very low to, to moderate water needs. They grow tall. If you don't mow them, you end up with a meadow-like look. Uh, but you can cut them down, cut them back um, to about four to five inches, about four to six inches, which is still pretty high, but it does look more like a traditional lawn. Uh, tolerates medium to light foot traffic, but they are mounding grasses. They tend to form these hummocks. So it's, it's not, uh, not something you want to play ball on because you get there's, there's sort of lumpy uh, lawns that you would walk on, but they're very pretty. Uh, you can install them year round, but uh, late winter and early spring will be ideal as either sod or plugs. And these are pretty widely available. And there are many other alternatives. Uh, dwarf carpet of stars is a succulent, so it doesn't have very good foot. Uh, it can't walk on it very well, you crush the, uh, uh, crush it. Uh, but, and the other drawback with this is that it, it tends to get woody and uh, over time, so it's not pleasant to walk on, it gets bare spots, so you have to replant it very often. But it's extremely drought tolerant and very attractive. Herbaceous plants like oregano or creeping thyme are lovely. They have a fragrance when you walk on them. Uh, they do have flowers, so they will attract bees. So that's an issue. Uh, yarrow is another a low growing yarrow, low water use. Carpet bugle, uh, Juba reptans, produces these lovely purple flowers, purple blue flowers, uh, which can be mowed off if you want it to, to stay low. Um, Native bent grasses for a sort of meadow-like look. Horseskin mint, low-growing mint, uh, snow in the summer, native sedges, mondo grass, which is uh, a very shade tolerant, but somewhat invasive grass, tends again, a mounding grass, chamomiles. So there's, there's many alternatives and, and you don't have to pick just one. You can consider mixing several different of these alternatives in sort of a tapestry lawn. Uh, we know that monocultures aren't natural. Real ecosystems involve a variety of plant species that, that uh, support different functions in the ecosystem. So, you know, why not do that with your, your uh, lawn alternative? For instance, you could mix uh, clover, nitrogen fixing clover with a grass uh, like UC Verde or you could mix it with uh, herbaceous plants like thyme and rosemary and, and yarrow uh, to provide needed nitrogen and companion plants. And by using a mixed culture, you, you might actually be able to design uh, a landscape that maintains its appearance and visual interests you know, across all four seasons, you have different things flowering at different times in the year. You do, however, need to pick plants with similar, uh, you know, similar cultural needs and growth rates. Otherwise, one plant will overtake uh, the others. Well, how much does this cost? How much does it cost? Well, alternatives that you install as plugs or plants or sod generally cost you know, anywhere from 50 to $400 per 100 square feet of lawn area. 
and an estimate that I got for, for the uh, standard turf grass sod that we use, it's about $150 per 100 square feet. So they're, they could be cheaper, they could be more expensive, uh, but they're you know, the same order of magnitude, at least in terms of cost. But alternatives that you plant from seed, like clovers or Bermuda grass or bent grass, they cost you know two to four dollars per hundred square foot of lawn area for the seed, and grass seed mixes are typically about three dollars a square foot, so very comparable in cost for the seeds. Uh, the uh, micro clover is is at the higher end of that range. It might be more like five dollars or more per hundred square feet of lawn. But note these are just the costs for the uh, the plants themselves or the seeds. And the cost of site preparation, removing your lawn, amending your soil, uh, reinstalling your irrigation. Um, that's going to add to the total cost, it's going to be comparable or or more than the actual cost of the plants of labor. And labor and um, you know, labor is expensive. But to help you with that, both of our water districts here in Contra Costa County, uh, Contra Costa Water District and East Bay Mud, offer rebates for reducing your, your uh, water thirsty turf grass with, with uh, alternatives. East Bay Mud. Has a lawn has two different lawn conversion rebates. One is a dollar twenty-five a square foot. Um, if you remove your lawn, choose all low water use plants, and remove your sprinklers, and convert to a drip irrigation or hand water, and add three inches of mulch. Uh, if you want to get the super rebate of two fifty a square foot, you have to sheet mulch to reduce your law. Uh, and uh, the master gardeners have good good uh, videos and and. Uh, literature on how to sheep uh, mulch your lawn. Uh, you have to add compost to replenish the soil. You have to choose a majority of California native plants and you have to plant in the cool season from September through February when it's raining so the plants get established. Uh, East Bay Mud also has a landscape design assistance program. You can get a $200 rebate for a two hour consultation with the landscape designer. Uh, you, they have to be a landscape designer on one of their lists, however, to get that. And another thing which is not really plant related, but East Bay Mud will pay for half the cost of a flow meter to monitor your water use, uh, which is very useful for detecting leaks. Uh, you can either install these at the water meter, which is very easy. It just straps onto your existing water meter. And you have a little device in your house that, uh, that talks to the, the, the flow meter, or you can install it at the, uh, the point of entry of your pipe, your water main into your house. And that typically requires a plumber. Um, you should check with your homeowner's insurance to see if they also offer rebates for flow meters. My homeowner's insurance company did. They paid for half the cost. And East Bay Med Mud paid for us half the cost. So my flow meter was essentially free. Uh, and it, it was actually useful because we went away uh, about three weeks ago. Our neighbors had somebody come in and repair a fence. They came into my yard, used my spigot to mix up their concrete, and they didn't shut the spigot all the way. Uh, so it was dripping about a gallon a minute, and I got an alert on my phone saying, hey, you got a leak at your home. So I was able to call my you know, my neighbor. They came over and turned off the faucet, and it was, uh, it was wonderful. Insurance companies like these because if that happens in your house, you can detect a leak and not have the terrible flood damage in your house um, or you know, minimize the flood damage that you might have in your house. Uh, sorry, that was a digression. But uh, Contra Costa Water District also has a, a rebate, a lawn to garden rebate for, of a dollar a square foot. They're a little bit cheaper uh, in terms of uh, their generosity. Uh, note that both Contra Costa and East Bay Mud limit single family rebates to $2,000 no matter what you do. And uh, Contra Costa Water District also has a landscape design assistance program, a $200 rebate, uh, for, again, for a two hour consultation with one of their approved landscape designers. But Contra Costa Water District will pay you twice. You can get the consultation for your front yard and for your backyard for a total of $400. So going to the end here. So what I hope you got out of this is I hope you now know what a turf grass is, why we have turf grass lawns, where they came from, and that we need a lot of water uh, in Contra Costa County or the Bay Area in general if you want your lawn to stay green during our dry summer. That there are a number of viable alternatives to turf grass lawns. Uh, and when you get the handout, you will get uh, many resources to learn more about them. And uh, you heard something about the strengths and weaknesses of the various alternatives. This is uh, just a few of the resources that are listed in your handout. There are more there. Thank you.
uh, many more on the handout. And Gail, we'll take it away. And I'll be back to answer questions later. Well, thank you, Henry. That was um, an incredible education on uh, turf lawn alternatives. So um, I'm uh, really in, appreciate your time. Um, and also want to mention to our audience that uh, you can get more information uh, about gardening. Um, there's a lot of rich uh, research-based information on the Contra Costa County Master Gardener website. Uh, we have pages on uh, all the social media, the major social medias, and um, we have a YouTube channel. Um, if you live in Contra Costa County and you have questions about uh, turf lawn alternatives or any other gardening, you can contact us at our help desk and there's the URL. Go ahead, Dan. So um, we have a couple more sessions coming up. We hope you enjoyed this uh, and are interested in joining us for a couple more that we have scheduled for the balance of this year. And I will be working on next year's calendar. So um, please join us. Uh, and also if there are some topics that you were not able to attend live, but interested in seeing, we have uh, a, our YouTube channel, and uh, also the Contra Costa Library has um, recordings of these talks. So you can go back to our library and, um, and, and watch some of these. You will receive a survey from the University of California, usually comes out in a couple of months, uh, but they like to understand how we are benefiting the, the public with these programs. And so um, we'd love to hear from you. But in the meantime, I think uh, there's a whole lot of folks who are interested in uh, the rich amount of research and information that Henry has put together. So um, we have a handout. If you click, um, put your, your camera up and, and, um, and access the QR code, you will get a brief survey. It will take you to a thank you page. And on that thank you page is a link to Henry's um, excellent researched um, information. So please do, um, I guess uh, grab his handout. And in the meantime, we're gonna go, um, also, I just saw that Serenity um, has put uh, the link to the survey into the chat. So we don't, we don't monitor questions in the chat, but we do provide information there. And um, so you can get that uh, URL and access there. Uh, I do see um, we're gonna, shift over and have our uh, questions now to Henry. So I've, I've um, identified some questions that have come through the, the, um, the Q&A icon. And so we're gonna go through and ask a few of those questions. I see a couple of folks have raised their hands. And if you could um, please put your questions into the Q&A, uh, we'd gladly address some of those, um, your questions there. So uh, Henry, I'm gonna start at the top, um, kind of goes in order of your presentation. So we had some question, um, one in particular, uh, you talked about how hot um, artificial turf can get and um, on the surface, it, was there any information about how hot it can get under the surface um, where uh, all that great you know, life lives in the soil. Um, I'm sure there was, I don't recall, but certainly you know, in the top inch, it's gonna be, it's gonna decay roughly exponentially with depth, uh, not the top inch. So the, the top inch is gonna be pretty, still pretty hot. The top five inches uh, will be warmed. Uh, there is, I, I just got a story, an anecdotal you know, evidence from another fellow master gardener whose neighbor put down uh, artificial turf and all their shrubs died next to it. Um, and I think it's probably a combination of, of heat damage and lack of water. 
but yeah. I, I don't know offhand. You know, I could I could easily model it, but I can't. <laughs> the science and you, uh, scientist the, 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 the you, scientist in you, science geek will want to do that. Uh, you know, think about a, a two hundred degree, uh, you know, iron on your on your your soil, and leave it there for twelve hours. Not twelve hours. Leave it there for four hours. Say at least those peak temperatures during midday. That that uh, heat is going to go travel reasonably far down to the ground. You do that every day. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Henry. Okay, um, the next question, and we're now starting to move into the um, the information that you gave on on uh, the crops. Um, alternative crops. So are there any alternatives that could be used in a vegetable garden as a cover crop and weed suppressor? Hmm. Well, there certainly are plenty of things that, that, that use in a cover crop. Um, they're not, that's not really a lone alternative in that case, because you're growing stuff in between uh, things like vetches, it depends, also depends what season you're growing things in. You're growing in the winter or the summer. So summer, you could grow vetch, you can grow cowpeas, um, you could grow, uh, you could grow uh, ryegrass. Um, in the winter, you can, again, grow vetches, you can grow uh, uh, clovers, uh, radishes, actually, they'll penetrate the soil, uh, sort of mustard-like cover crops. To, which are supposedly help with the uh, with some uh, noxious insects in soil. Okay. Um, since you mentioned clover, I'll, I'll go to that question next. Um, what does micro clover look like when it's dormant? Uh, it gets a little. It can get patchy looking. It stays green, but it but it uh, it looks a little threadbare. Okay. All right. Um, this is, uh, I'm just going to kind of put it out there. This is a little bit more of a fan, uh, kind of following up on your comments about um, carapia. And the point being that carapia sets deep, deep roots, uh, mm -hmm. acting as a very good um, slope stabilizer. So there was, uh, there was a big, you know, uh, kind of uh, I guess embellishing on some of the good the points that you made there. It, um, it will grow on on steep slopes. Uh, I think UC Davis has some pictures of it, uh, and certainly the Japanese websites that uh, deal with carapia have pictures of it on you know, forty five degree slopes. Um, yeah, actually, much of the audience may have more experience than I do with some of these plants, since since so many of you have uh, have already uh, done something with your lawns. A good number of you used a ground cover. So this is um, a little bit maybe tangential, but perhaps you could chat about it since we have a moment. Um, it's it it asks the question is, is there a best way of removing grass? So if you're getting started now, I know this talk was really about the alternatives, mm -hmm. but can you, you know, maybe a recommendation of where somebody can go and get information on this? So, so if you go to uh, the UC Master Gardeners website, there are whole presentations on, on removing your lawn. I think probably the gold standard is what uh, Contra Costa Water District, not the, the East Bay Mud pays more for, which is sheet mulching your lawn. That involves covering your lawn with cardboard and then putting mulch on top of that and uh, watering it infrequently. But you basically compost your, your existing lawn in place. You starve it for light uh, and you the, comp the uh, cardboard breaks down over time, adds more organic material to the soil. Uh, and it, it, it's quite effective in killing your lawn. Other alternatives are... Um, to get a sod cutter. You know, there are machines that come in and, and cut off the roots of, of the grass and lift up the sod. Uh, that removes some of the topsoil and removes you know, organic material from your, your yard. You're gonna have to add more compost and organic material to, to make up for that. Um, I think those are probably the, and, and certainly herbicides. There's certainly, uh, you know, but I'm not gonna say you should use those, uh, but but there are, there are herbicides specifically for grasses and there are herbicides, a more general uh, broad spectrum herbicides. And you can kill your lawn that way. Just have to be careful not to kill stuff that you don't want to kill. 
All right, very good. And all those great microbes that live in the soils. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so a uh, question here is, in your opinion, what would be a best selection for a very large lawn? So there's a homeowners association um, that is considering um, removing some of its uh, large grass area. So what would be perhaps a good alternative in a in a um, large um, large swatch? Sort of depends what the use of that that area is. Is it for you know? Is it just a visual? green space that nobody ever walks on or is it used for, to play softball um i, I can't give a, a general answer uh to that without knowing you know also where is it you know, you know, is it where in contra Costa county or where in the bay area is it mm -hmm. um, uh so i don't i don't think i can give you a general answer to it. okay all right fair enough it was uh, it was just East Bay, so I I couldn't yeah. help uh, help zero in for you a little bit more on that one. So um, maybe not the the easiest it, softball. It, it, it gets, gets gets back to the the word that word cloud chart. What's important to you? Do you want to be able to walk on it? Do you want to minimize the water use? Uh, do you not want to have to maintain it? So it's, you know, there's questions that have to be asked before you can give a best alternative answer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you have um, perhaps a, a be, be, besides silver carpet? Is there another good suggestion for coastal area? So, um, well, let's see. There's um, there's sedges that might be good. Um, I think if you look at the handouts, sedges. Uh, if it's really damp and moist. Irish moss. Um, you know, when you say coastal, is it it's, it's more temperate or is it actually foggy and wet? So mm -hmm. it, okay. it depends. Uh, the uh, this one I'm trying to think of um, bugle weed might be okay. That's the the purple flowered one. Uh, there are native grasses that are native to the coast, but they tend to be clumpy and mm -hmm. they're not flat green spaces. They don't create that carpet kind of. They don't uh, create the toppy yeah. bear. Yeah. Uh, okay, here's some. Um, just... Are there um, is is there any information about some of these um, turf alternative plants with respect to recycled water? Um, you know, during the heavy drought, a lot of folks brought in water um, from Contra Costa Water, provided it, and you could bring in a, a a big tank full into your yard. Is there any information on how that affects? I haven't plants. seen any specific information. The recycled water, I'm guessing, I'm not sure, you'd have to test it, but I'm, I'm guessing it probably has more dissolved solids in it than, than our uh, treated tap water. Uh, so you don't want things that are, that are sensitive to salinity. And some of the alternatives are, you know, are insensitive to salinity, other, other, uh, others are, are pretty, uh, uh, pretty, pretty forgiving. Um, you know, if they grow in, and I, I don't, I don't want to answer anymore because I don't actually know the, uh, but I would look at the, the, um, uh, tolerance to salinity and alkalinity of, of the plants. And that kind of information is available if you look through the research, but I don't know of a study specifically of, uh, using recycled water. Okay. Um, UC question... Davis has a very good website with, with showing, you know, that they have test plots that have grown a number of these things uh, under a range of irrigation conditions, everything from full irrigation, what the plant would love to have, down to you know, 10 percent to 15 percent of what the plant really wants. Uh, when you get down that low, nothing looks very good. Okay. Um, can you seed clover? 
over an existing lawn or do you need to yeah. remove that lawn first? No, you can, you can, you can reseed it. You can put top seeded, uh, it's called. Uh, and if you encourage the clover, it will, will maybe even choke out all your grass. But yes, you can, you can easily do that. And the, uh, the cost is less, one, because you're not removing the lawn, but also because the amount of seed that you need is less than if you're uh, seeding a, a bare soil. Okay. Someone asked about native ground covers and something in the chat here, uh, like ceanothus. So the things I've covered are, are not, ceanothus is a woody plant, so it would not be, it's very nice, uh, but it's not something you can walk on. So it's going to have branches and be uh, tough on your feet. So most of the things, really all of the things, uh, at least when they are young that I talked about, are not woody plants. Things like thyme uh, and the ajuga do get woody over time and do have to be replaced. But, uh, but that takes three to five years or more. Okay. Uh, not the ajuga. Uh, I lost it. Other questions? Uh, there's so one of the questions is: Is there a a favorite for keeping out weeds? Is is, is there something that ends up being maybe a little bit more dense and helps with sort of you know sort of choking out any kind of weed growth? Um. Yeah. Carapia gets pretty dense. Uh, a grass like like the uh, UC Verde will get pretty dense. Uh, you, know, you do have to maintain it. Nothing is going to be you know, completely weed free, so you do have to, uh, particularly as they are as they are filling out, you'll have to weed things. Um, you know, again, it depends on your soil conditions, uh, what kind of weeds you have in your seeds you have in your your, uh, your soil. Um, one thing about the, that uh, sheet mulching will do is it will tend to to get rid of some of the soil the seeds in your soil because they will sprout and will die. This way, you don't have any light. And you're not rototilling, although you may have to rototill to bring compost. Uh, you're not rototilling and bringing new seeds up to the surface. One thing I should say it, uh, for sod, I, I talked about using a sod cutter to remove your lawn. Rather than hauling it away, if it doesn't have plastic mesh in it, uh, which some of the older sod varieties do, you can just turn it upside down set it down in place, and then sheet mulch that. So there you're, you're not taking away the organic material uh, that you're going to be adding back to the soil. You're uh, creating a green composting in place. In place, right composting there. in place. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, we've, um, we've kind of exhausted most of the questions, I would say, that kind of cover the themes. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm, I would say that we've, we've probably... Um, yeah filled our, our audience with, with good information and clearly with uh, your, your talk tonight and, uh, and the follow-up material that you've provided. It's just been a, a, a great education and, and great information for everybody. So we're getting a lot of thank yous. So when I start to get to the bottom of the list and I see a lot of thank yous, mm -hmm. I know that everybody has um, really appreciated and, and felt satisfied with the information that you've provided. So um, Henry, uh, can't thank you enough to be um, as our, mm -hmm. our presenter. Uh, I want to say thank you to our amazing Q&A team. Stephanie and Diane um, have been working diligently behind the scenes answering questions. Uh, Lori, our, our technical support, uh, Serenity and Ava from the Contra Costa County Library for co-sponsoring this event. And mostly thank you to everybody who's attended uh, and, and makes this all relevant for we who are the, the volunteers. We appreciate and enjoy uh, education and we're 
glad to have you here. So thank you very much. Please uh, complete the survey and access the handout. And I will add one thing that uh, if you had a burning question and you live in Contra Costa County and your question didn't get answered tonight, you can always send it to our help desk. The, uh, the email address for our help desk is, is on our website. Very nice. Thank you, Henry, for that follow-up. And thank you, everybody. Good night.